Jonathan Baylor pioneered the field of wellness engineering and is the founder and CEO of the world's fastest growing permanent weight loss and diabetes treatment company, Sane Solution. He authored the New York Times bestseller, The Calorie Myth, has registered over 26 patents, has spoken at Fortune 100 companies and TED conferences for over a decade, and served as senior program manager at Microsoft, where he helped create Nike Connect Training and Xbox Fitness. I've also been staying up to date and reading Jonathan's books since 2011 when he released The Smarter Science of Slim. Did I say that right, Jonathan? You did. Yeah. 2011, you go with the back catalog. Maybe. Oh yeah, that was, that was the first one of your books that I ever had and that's a fantastic resource for anyone that's not familiar. But um, yeah, excited to have you on, man. Welcome to the show. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, man. And actually, I, that's much love for reading The Smarter Science of Slim. That's kind of what started it all. So I really appreciate that. Oh, very cool. Very cool. So you and I today are going to tackle one of the biggest problems we face, not just in America, but in the world. Obesity, diabetes. What is this term diabetes? Explain that. <laughs> it's pretty shocking, Anthony, because when I say diabetes, most often people say, oh, that's a, that's a interesting term. Did you make that up? And I didn't. Diabetes, if you go on PubMed right now and you type in diabetes, it is a medically established term. And the, like, how ironic is it that this, this term, diabetes, which affects nine out of 10 Americans, we, most people don't even know that it's a term. Like, that's, that's crazy. I mean, that's, we're over here worried about, you know, whatever is going to happen next. And the thing that the medical condition that is killing more people than anything else, more than terrorism, plane crashes, heart disease, all of these things combined, the word for it, most people haven't even heard of. Well, it's, it sounds like a word that was made up because we just got tired of saying two words that often went together. You know what I mean? Like the obesity, diabetes, let's just say diabetes. You know, it's like, I'm tired and I'm feeling lazy. I'm tazy. It's like, <laughs> it's, it's, um, it, it's word it, economy at its finest. <laughs> well, and it's, it's really, it's, it's powerful because when you look at, I mean, I, I love, I, I love the term diabetes because if you say obesity or overweight, that carries a stigma with it, right? That, that right there says there's a, there's a huge portion of our population that's like, well, that's just a character flaw. Those, those people are just stupid and lazy, need to figure it out, need to eat less and exercise more. But if you say someone has diabetes, no one's like, oh, you character flaw, right? They, they, people know diabetes is a disease. But people also need to know, as the American Medical Association has publicly recognized, and they're one of the slowest moving medical institutions in the world, that obesity is classified as a disease. Because sure, there are lifestyle choices that can contribute to it, but as we've studied this and understood it scientifically, the underlying causes, the neurological inflammation, the hormonal dysregulation, and the gastrointestinal, gastrointestinal dysbiosis that are at the heart of diabetes are the same things that are at the heart of obesity, and in some people, they manifest as weight gain, and in some people, they manifest as diabetes, and whichever one manifests first, we're not really sure, but we do know that when one manifests, the other has about a 90% chance of following. So there's really no such thing as being overweight or being diabetic. You're going to be diabetes if you're either one, and that's a very severe issue. So we're in a, a place where 70% of people are overweight and obese, and you're saying, overweight or obese rather, and you're saying 90% of people so an additional 20% have this diabetes going on where there's some level of blood sugar dysregulation, hormonal imbalances, you mentioned neuroinflammation. Um, and so nine out of 10 people are dealing with this. That with is a hard thing. Yeah, because if, if you look at just diabetes, right? Diabetes and prediabetes is one in every two people. So, I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not a percentages expert here, but if you look at the adult population, if we have one condition, which is one out of every two people, we have another condition, which is seven out of every 10, to say that 90% of people are affected by this, either they have it or someone who they love dearly has it or they're about to have it, honestly is conservative. This is a question that I get asked a lot. I'm curious what your thoughts are. 
We're in a time where there are more gyms than ever, more workout programs than ever. There are more diets and nutrition books and cookbooks than ever. Why are so many people struggling with weight management and blood sugar regulation? What you just listed, Anthony, were they're portrayed as, as treatments. So for example, for the, for the disease of overweight, people will prescribe going to the gym or they will prescribe going on a diet. That's what will happen if you go to most doctors. They will say the treatment for your condition of overweight or obesity is to go to a gym or to go on a diet. Now, if you went to the doctor with a broken arm and the doctor said, cool, here's some cough syrup, You'd say, what, like what? I don't, I don't understand. That treatment doesn't match my medical condition, right? Rub some and, and we've got, on it. And we've got, you know, put some Robitussin on it. Put some Robitussin. <laughs> um, but we have, all sorts of cough medicine. <laughs> we have all sorts of cough medicine, though. We have more cough medicine, cough drops, lozenges, throat spray than we've ever had before. But you know what? They're not the right treatment for a broken arm. We have more calorie counting, starvation diet, tactics, techniques, information, blogs, websites, apps, diets than ever. And we have more workout protocols, which are just starvation in a less, uh, in a more time consuming way, right? If you're going to spend an hour on the treadmill to burn 600 calories, that's just a time consuming way to starve yourself of 600 calories. So starvation whether it be from excessive, incorrect, low quality exercise or starvation from a, I'm going to eat less food is to obesity and diabetes. What cough syrup is to a broken arm, incorrect treatment. So what do you feel is before we get to the treatment? Um, what do you feel is underlying the diabetes epidemic? What's what, what are, what's the cause or the cause is? From a biological perspective or from a societal perspective? Both. <laughs> from a biological perspective, uh, that, that one is simple. Neurological inflammation, hormonal imbalances, and uh, gut dysregulation. Those three things cause what is known as an elevated set point, whether it be an elevated set point body weight or an elevated set point of blood sugar. Either way, they break the body's your body, just backing up real quick, your body and every other biological organism on the planet seeks to maintain homeostasis, it's a term we all learned in high school biology, right? So if your body, if your blood sugar drops, your body takes steps to bring it back up. If it goes up, your body takes steps to bring it back down. So your blood sugar is a homeostatically regulated system in your body. You don't need to do anything. Your body is meant to balance it automatically. Blood pressure works the same way and body weight works the same way. Body temperature, everything works that way. If you sweat more, you drink more. You don't have to think about it. Your body just pursues it. So when you have a, a inflammation in your brain, dysregulation in your hormones, and dysbiosis in your gut, various homeostatic systems in your body break down. When the blood sugar homeostatic system breaks down, your blood sugar set point changes and you have diabetes. When the homeostatic regulation around your body weight breaks down, it creeps up you have obesity. When the, when the homeostatic system around your blood pressure breaks down, set point changes and you have hypertension. So these names of diseases are all just ways to characterize the breakdown in a homeostatic system or the change or elevation of a set point. So the elevation or change or dysregulation of a set point is what causes obesity. It's also what causes diabetes. Those things are caused by the brain gut hormone system that is doing that homeostatic regulation breaking down. Now, from a societal perspective, or even answer, more like behavioral lifestyle, what, what, where's, what are the under the things underlying this, this breakdown in homeostatic capacity? It's a breakdown in the quality of inputs introduced to the body. And I say that very, I say that statement very broad because it's not just about food, right? It's obviously food matters a tremendous amount. If you eat low quality food in any quantity, you will slowly become diabetes, period. Thousand calories 
of processed sugar, starch, and trans fats will make you diabetes slower than 2,000 calories, but you will become diabetes eventually if you mm -hmm. eat low-quality foods. There is also low-quality sleep. There is also low-quality relationships. I mean, this is a little mini anecdote, but I was, I was meeting with a doc, uh, Professor John Rady at the Harvard Medical School, and he's the guy that did all the trials around how exercise is as effective or more effective than SSRIs for treating depression. And they are in the process of conducting a study on Medicare B patients, huge study on what is the most predictive factor of longevity. And they found that you could take the impact of healthy eating and healthy exercise together, and they do not have the same impact on people's longevity as the quality of relationships in their life. So people's reported satisfaction with the quality of relationship in their life had a stronger correlation to their longevity than their eating habits and their exercise habits combined. Now it's obviously a correlation, it's not causation. But the point is, is you could, we can get food perfect, whatever that means. And if our movement is low quality, if our, if our self-perception is low quality, if our sleep is low quality, if our relationships are low quality, our, our metabolic chain will only be as strong as its weakest link. So we really have to look at our entire, the entire tapestry of inputs and ensure high quality for all of them. That's big right there. And this was a challenge or a reality that I became aware of moving to Florida. I moved here in part because I wanted to be by the beach. I could, could work from anywhere. And um, it, was, it was an amazing lifestyle opportunity. I also had 35 years of relationships, uh, connections with friends and family and all of that in Chicago that I left behind. You know, I didn't discard it, but I'm also not, as you know, I'm not a big phone guy. <laughs> so like, I started realizing here, especially after my ex-girlfriend and I decided that it was, it made sense for us to part ways. I was like, this is a problem. I could feel it. I could tell that no matter how healthy I was eating and how much I worked out, I was missing a very important part of my life, of a happy, well-balanced life. And that was those relationships that, that you're talking about in this study are showing a greater correlation with longevity than exercise and diet. Did I understand that right? Yep. <laughs> exercise and diet combined. So they assigned what they, they did a questionnaire with Medicare B patients. I believe it was in California. The study is not released yet because it was, I'm talking to the guy who did it and they had people fill out questionnaires and they, they then assigned points to, okay, you eat healthy, you get this many points, you exercise regularly, you get this many points, you say you're like very satisfied with the relationships in your life. And it really, here's a really important distinction. It was not the quantity of relationships they had. It was not even an objective measure of quality of relationships. It was their perception ah. of how high, like, so for example, if they had one close friend who they just cherished and loved. And if you ask them, Hey man, like, do you feel supported and connected? And their answer was yes. The objective reality was meaningless. It was their perception of being connected to other people, that thing, that perceived connection and having support more profoundly predicted longevity in baby boomers than both proper eating and exercise combined. That is nuts. It makes you wonder if this is something linked to like, you know, our monkey brain or our reptilian brain, where if we don't have a, a, a connection and feel like someone has our back, we even at the subconscious level may feel unsafe. You know, like we are isolated from the tribe and exposed and at risk of predators attacking us. I don't know what it is. I don't know if anyone really knows what it is, but that is pretty cool. And it's amazing because when you start, when you, when you have that distinction that you just made, Anthony, where it's like these things, these like our perception of reality, our perception of our relationships, our actual relationships, these things correlate with conditions like diabetes so strongly, then we can have fun thought experiments like, Hey, uh, is using a microwave the best thing in the world for you? 
Probably not. However, is getting stressed the hell out about never using a microwave, throwing it away, feeling like a crappy mother if you microwave high quality food for your kids, that stress and shame will hurt you more than the microwave ever could. Objectively, like it will do things to your hormones and to your brain that like, let's say you eat a donut. The shame or guilt that you feel from eating that donut is objectively more fattening than the donut. Yeah, that's why you should just make yourself throw up afterwards and pretend it didn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> kidding, kidding, kidding. Um, I totally agree, though. Like, it's it, it, there's probably some connection there too. To um, you know, there is a, a biochemical aspect of food that in, impacts our health, but there's probably also our perception of that food that has. I don't know. I don't, I can't quantify it, but it definitely has an impact. And you see people driving themselves crazy, trying to micromanage all of the different things in our environment that could be bad for us. It's, it's, a, it's a very reactive, vulnerable, um, disempowering place to live from. It is. And it, it not only is counterproductive in a sense that it will objectively cause reactions in your brain and in your hormones that are counter to health. Mm -hmm. But the human body is designed to take low dose badness and super compensate. So mm -hmm. the, I'm, what I'm not saying is eat a little bit of toxic garbage every once in a while because that'll strengthen your body. But what I am saying is if you look at, for example, the way human muscle tissue works, the worst thing you could do for it is give it the least adversity possible. Mm -hmm. Job you, of the hut. Right? That's, that, that, that doesn't work, right? So on some level, that's the same kind of thing like living in a bubble or never having any exposure to viruses or bacteria. You mm -hmm. want to make yourself prone to disease long term? Never expose yourself to low dose anything. So like, yeah. But that's so important, right? Because we're, there's so much I would consider over-optimization or, or even focusing on these. Let me just give you a, a, a specific concrete example. Ask anybody who says they're super concerned with their health how many green vegetables they ate on average every day of the week for the past week. Answers are nine out of 10 healthy people you ask will say either none or a very low number. And if you ask them about like much more advanced things, they're like, oh yeah, I did all this crazy other stuff. I did this, I did this, I this. But they're not eating vegetables. You know what I mean? So it's like, there's so many kind of little things that people get stressed out about. They feel shame about. That's counterproductive. And it causes us to lose focus on the things that really matter, like relationships, like sleep, like eating vegetables. These are the things that we know reduce the inflammation in your brain, re-regulate your hormones and heal your gut, which make diabetes impossible once you have that, that level of health in place. Yeah. I, I think for anyone listening who is dealing with weight management issues, diabetes or otherwise, what you've said there about those social connections is huge. You know, you and I have like we met in person and hung out at Mike Geary's mastermind event. And we've, you know, we've got to hang out there a bunch of times. And like, that's something that I look forward to every few months, hanging out with like-minded um, health and fitness entrepreneurs. And we need to be able to step back and objectively look at our life. And if, if our social interaction is only coming through devices, through Facebook, text message, things like that, it is, it is not a substitute. And the technical stuff that you and I are going to get into will be another variation of, um, it, it may move the needle, but at the same time, we're going for quality of life here and longevity, not just getting the weight off. It all goes together. So we need to, like my assessment of myself, I realized it was a huge problem. Part of the reason I got involved in playing soccer, part of the reason after you and I are done, I'm taking Kumba for a walk on Atlantic Avenue and like going to go to dinner. You know what I mean? And like, we have to get out and get that because 
our brain responds and every aspect of our physiology responds. And if you put these other things first and on top of that, drive yourself crazy, you know, focusing on everything that's bad for you. Um, even if you do get the diabetes and, you know, excess body fat part of it handled, the quality of life and the longevity component will still be compromised. And I would argue that you actually can't, you might be able to, it might seem like you have overweight handled because that's very clear. Like, Oh, I'm thin. The underlying damage, right? You can, you can be burning your hand on a stove and not feel it, but your hand is still burning. It's just numb, right? So there is underlying damage and there's all sorts of fitness competitors. I mean, there's all sorts of athletes and fitness competitors out there who phys- have a fa- fantastic physique. But, you know, what's that going to do in 20, 30, 40 years? The underlying impact on your pancreas, the underlying impact on everything else will man. You, you can't smoke and not have it impact your lungs, period. That's what smoking does. Now, not everyone who smokes will get lung cancer, but everyone who smokes will have their health compromised as a result. The same thing applies to any other form of low quality input. It's, it's, it, it is going to harm you, whether it manifests as a diagnosable disease, TBD, but you know, you're high quality. So why would you subject yourself to anything other than high quality? Do you have any, for someone that knows they're lacking these social connections, do you have any advice for a person in that position? Like, where do you start? Is it getting, is it, is it going on, you know, meetup.com and, and looking for groups that are related to things that you're interested in and going to those? Is it, um, you know, is it, is it taking classes, dance classes, you know, there's so many people and I'm asking this not to deviate from the technical health aspect, but because there are some people that are like, yeah, I get it. I am, I do feel isolated. I know this is a problem and I don't know what to do about it. That was, that was why I don't want to gloss over it because I sometimes wrestle with, with these things myself. I'm, I'm hesitating because I am not as much of an expert in that area uh, as I would consider myself to be in other areas. And I feel like as a society, we have everything we've done as a society over the past 20 years has made this harder. Mm -hmm. I have very strong opinions about social media, which we will not get into on this podcast because it'll probably get me in trouble. But um, I, you know, I think that one, it is impossible to meet So my mother used to tell me, Jonathan, avoid the occasion of sin. So for example, if you want your marriage to go well, don't put yourself in a context where there's even a possibility that something bad could happen. Now, let's flip that. So there's a 100% chance that if I stay in my house, I will not make any meaningful connections. 100% chance. So so while I might not be able to tell you exactly where to go and exactly what to do, it, there is a hundred percent chance that if you, what is the old saying? You miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Yeah. You know what? I don't know what it is. Go to the grocery store and be nice to people, talk to people. And you know, the thing that I find helpful is what this study showed was not the people who had the most Facebook friends or the most people in their contact list. I don't have a lot of friends. I can't tell you the last time I hung out with a friend. I have a wife who I love very much. I have a daughter who I love very much and I see my in-laws on holidays. So I, I don't have like a giant network of friends. I, it's my experience that relationships are, much like everything else in life where it's about quality rather than quantity. So, you know, can you, can you look to your past? Can you reconnect with people who maybe you did have relationships with in the past? And also look, sometimes there's an irony where when we try to help ourselves, 
it's like, it like, it's like it eludes us. The harder we try directly to help ourselves, the harder it is. But if we say, look, I'm just going to try to help other people. Mm -hmm. So like, where, where could you, don't, don't like, you know, there's an old anecdote of the worst way to find a spouse is to be like, oh, I really need to find a spouse right now. Like I really want to fall in love right now. I'm going to try really hard to fall in love. I'm thinking, got to get married, got to have a baby. It doesn't, that usually doesn't work out well, but it's usually like it happens indirectly. So, you know what I, and just in terms of happiness, right? Some of the happiness research has shown very clearly that the most beneficial and rewarding experiences in life have nothing to do with what you do for yourself. It's what you have to do for others. So I would encourage, I mean, there is no shortage of people who are suffering in this world. So where in your community can you contribute? Can I did that, man. I think that's, that's what I would say. I dig that. Basically, like anything that you want more of in your life, ask yourself how you can give that to other people. And, you know, if you want more connection, then, you know, start brainstorming ideas of how you can help other people feel more connected and get going. Um, yeah, yeah I, I went to church for the first time in a real long time on Sunday, carving out a little bit more, um, a little, an hour for my spiritual practice, right? And I'm not a super religious guy, but I wasn't doing it on my own. So I'm like, if I go to church, that's an hour where I'm going to be doing it. And this church does a ton in the community for helping other people. And I was like, all right, that's a perfect example of like, you want more connection, help other people feel more connected and, you know, getting involved in some of those things. So I signed up for that. And like, and, and you know, it's not like either of us are saying we have the answers. We're more just trying to provide a, a, a jumping off point for what what we know is as important or possibly more than the nutrition and the exercise and some of the other biohacks that we're getting into. So, all right, not to meander, but I'm glad we, we touched on it because I didn't want people going like, I don't even know where to start, you know? Um, okay, so someone, what, what defines, what are the terms, the benchmarks, um, the, the levels on a blood test that define diabetes? To be diabetes, technically, I mean, you're just looking at, and again, I, I, I have some issues with these measurements, but it's, do you have diabetes, which is generally diagnosed using your A1C levels, uh, diabetes, pre-diabetes, and are you overweight or obese, which is calculated using your BMI? Now, the BMI measure is bogus and should be ignored. <laughs> According to BMI, I'm obese. And I think if you saw me, you would not consider me to be obese. No, you've got abs. <laughs> but um, I think the number one thing when you, what I, what I would encourage people to focus less on is are these sort of arbitrary medical numbers? Because, you know, if you, if you, if you look just according to these, these charts, I'm going to make up numbers. Let's say that if you're 5.0, you're diabetic. And if you're 4.9, you're not. Mm hmm so what a lot of people hear when they hear that is, oh, I'm at 4.9. Right. But it's a continuum. It's a continuum. So there is there just because you're not officially X, I mean, the, the, the takeaway of all of this is like, look, you deserve all of what life has to offer, period. So if you're carrying excess fat on your body, you're not able to experience all of life has to offer. Mm-hmm. If your body is not functioning properly from a glucose metabolism perspective, that's going to affect your energy. That's going to affect your mental acuity. That's going to affect your sex life. It's going to affect, that's going to affect your ability to meet other people. Diabetes is going to radically affect your ability to meet other people because like it or not, how we look affects how other people perceive us. And our energy levels, our motivation, our desire, our personality, these are all functions. I mean, we've all had this experience, right? Where it's like, Someone cuts you off in traffic and you're feeling good about yourself. You're feeling good about your life. And you're like, huh, wonder what's wrong with that guy. Why did he cut me off? Silly goose. And it doesn't really bother us versus if our health is in a compromised perspective, we're tired, we're hungry, we're not feeling good. Exact same stimulus happens. Fly into a rage, right? There's a, there's a, a, a interesting study was done that found that people are radically more likely to cheat on their spouses when they're dieting. When they're dieting? Really? Do you know why? Because dieting compromises your willpower. It makes you feel like crap. 
And so you're hypersensitive to various dopamine inputs and someone from the other sex paying attention to you, sort of you, have, you don't have as much willpower and you're, hyper, uh, uh, you're hypersensitive to stimulation. So you're, you are radically more likely to do something in that state, in a starvation mode state, than you would be otherwise. Just like if someone's intoxicated, they're gonna be much more likely to do something than if they weren't intoxicated. That's why these high quality inputs will radically, I mean, it's, it's a virtuous cycle, right? So you might be saying, how do I meet people? You know, taking care of yourself, it's a virtuous cycle, right? Because if you take care of you and you treat yourself with high quality, the type of person who you will become is the type of person who other people will want to spend time with. So if you take care of yourself while also pursuing taking care of others, you're gonna create this virtuous cycle which will be super helpful to not only you, but more importantly, all of those around you. There's a really cool, I don't remember who said this, it wasn't me, who said that you can define how successful a person is by how successful the people around them are. Hmm. And I was like, wow, that's, that's really powerful. You got me thinking too, how much of going to foods that we know intellectually are not good for us is satisfying some of the chemicals our brain is not getting because we're isolated or uh, lacking connection. Um, and, and we're using some of the, some of these foods to self medicate. And, and it's, that's part of that may be part of why it's not as easy to just cut your carbs. Absolutely. That's exactly, I mean, it, that's, that's not a, uh, I will, I'll take it further and say that's, that's not a theory, Anthony. I mean, that's, that's a fact. The next, the DSM, the next version of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual that psychologists and psychiatrists use to diagnose addiction, while it is not going to necessarily cause, call out food addiction as a clinically diagnosable thing, it's taking steps in that direction due to a bunch of research that's been done at University of Florida, Princeton, and Yale. And with any addiction, I, like alcohol, heroin, cocaine, sugar, there, no one does those things because the, everybody does them for the same reason, because there is a hole that is ex devastatingly painful that needs to be filled, period. And they're using that substance to trigger that chemical reaction in their brain, period. And it doesn't mean that everyone who's like happily married eats healthfully, that's obviously not true. It's not, it's not the case that everyone has a deep spiritual connection to the universe or to God eats healthfully. That's also not true. Mm -hmm. But we do know that the likelihood of an individual seeking damaging substances will drop precipitously if the sort of hole in your brain <laughs> that craves those things is smaller and filled with positive things. Because you can be addicted to, I'm addicted to seeing my daughter. Mm-hmm. It's hard for me to function without seeing her. Now that she exists, and that's the definition of addiction, Addiction, just as a fun anecdote, because my dad's a um, drug and addictions counselor. That's what he does professionally. And if, like, if you like drinking coffee, but you can function fine without it, so coffee kind of takes you from feeling good to feeling great, it's not an addiction. But if you can't function without drinking coffee, meaning you have to drink coffee to not feel bad, that's an addiction. So if you have to take something to just not feel bad, that's an addiction. You can have healthy addictions. In fact, that's one of the most powerful ways to live life is to be addicted to healthy and empowering and high quality things. We just need to flood your life with that. Okay, cool. So if someone's listening and they're trying to figure out, am, am I suffering from diabetes? Um, are we just looking for excess body fat and blood sugar dysregulation? Is there like a, is there a fasted blood glucose level that is considered diabetes, someone that, you know, considered to indicate that someone is diabetes? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, what, what would someone, if, if they're wondering, how would they figure that out? You, if you went to your doctor and if you, if you know that you're not just very muscular, so your BMI is somewhat relevant. If your BMI would classify you as overweight or obese, and when you got your A1C levels measured, your doctor said, hey, you're in the pre-diabetic or diabetic range. If you are diagnosed with pre-diabetes or diabetes, 
and you are diagnosed with overweight or obesity, you are diabetes. If those two things exist at the same time. Okay, cool. And we've, we've covered relationships. What, what are some of the other most important next steps for correcting this epidemic or fixing it in yourself if you're a part of it? Obviously, nutrition is extremely important. The right kind of physical movement is extremely important. Proper rest is extremely important. And the way you talk to yourself or your relationship with yourself is extremely important. So in, in, in each of those categories, let's start with nutrition. What's the one thing that will have the biggest impact? Is it, is it hitting a daily carb target, you know, keeping it under 50 net carbs per day? Um, is it just, you know, eating eight servings of green plants? What would you suggest is like the one thing for nutrition? For this and for all categories, we have to first establish it's got to be what to do. Because you tell people what not to do, the brain will hyper-focus on the negative, make it very difficult to pursue the positive. We can talk about that more later. What to do is to flood your body with vegetables, period. The one dietary change, I don't want you to eliminate anything. I want you to eat double-digit servings of non-starchy vegetables every day. If you were to do that, it would be impossible to be diabetes for many reasons. One, it's a therapeutic level of nutrition that will actively heal you. But two, it will crowd out everything else. And that's extremely powerful, right? Everyone's talking about eat, don't eat this, eliminate this, cut this out. No, not negative, shame, guilt, bad. If you fill half your plate with non-starchy vegetables every single time you eat, it will be very difficult to harm your body. Can you, can you rattle off some examples of non-starchy vegetables for someone listening that's like, tell me what to eat, I'll eat a ton of it. <laughs> Anything green, that's a plant. So broccoli, asparagus, any leafy vegetable. Try to avoid um, iceberg lettuce because it's just not very nutritious, but most other forms of lettuce. And then as a general rule of thumb, anything that could be eaten raw, that's a plant that is not a fruit. So if you can't eat potatoes raw, they're a starch. You can't eat corn raw, it's a starch. But you know, uh, avocados, uh, the, what the peppers, cucumbers, mushrooms, asparagus, zucchini, squash, anything you could put in a salad traditionally from a vegetable perspective. You just want to make sure you're not eating a bunch of starches. People sometimes confuse starches with vegetables. Potatoes and corn aren't a vegetable. They're a starch. Beautiful. And where do, where do tomatoes fit into this? Those tomatoes are, are yeah, tomatoes are technically a fruit, but no one has diabetes because they're eating too many tomatoes. <laughs> so that's an important thing to keep in mind. They're like nightshades. Yeah, we have, we definitely have a diabetes epidemic because people are eating too many eggplants. That's the problem. Um, but I digress. The, uh, the tomatoes, like, look, nobody's having a problem because they're eating too many tomatoes. So if you love tomatoes, that, there was a study done at Stanford University where they compared high carb against low carb, against whatever, against whatever, against whatever, whatever, whatever. The key conclusion of the study was, you know what the most effective diet is? The one that you can do. Yeah. And so that's the thing, you know, people are like, which is the best vegetable? Which vegetable do you enjoy eating and will you eat in abundance? That's the best vegetable. Now, We'll give some parameters around that. But, you know, so often we look to, you know, Jonathan, tell me what the best thing is. The best thing is what will work for you. So I can give you guidelines. Anthony can give you guidelines. But it's you who's got to go to the grocery store, make that decision, make that decision every time you're out to eat, make that decision every time you look in your refrigerator. And if you're seeing food there that you don't like, that's not going to work over time. So the key thing is to figure out what works for you within a scientifically proven template versus just like, tell me what to do. Cause that doesn't, that doesn't work. And if it did work, it would have worked already. Cause we've had people telling us what to do for the past 40 years and it led to the diabetes epidemic. And I'm going to say it underline a lot of this, not all of it. I agree in terms of classification, it is a disease but underlying a lot of this is laziness. 
It is cognitive laziness. And it is, it, let's say the example you gave about um, the vegetables, right? Part of the reason a lot of vegetables don't taste good is because we have not taken the time to learn how to make them taste good. We've not gotten one of the thousands of recipe books that are in a paleo or keto or whatever template that would help heal blood sugar dysregulation and taking a little bit of extra time to build a new skill set, which is what is required for fixing a problem. It's work and it requires a, an energy investment up front and abolishing the laziness that created the problem in the first place. Unless you're type one diabetic, I believe it is a lifestyle choice largely. Now it doesn't, it, it, that lifestyle choice may have been a result of a lack of information. That's okay. I've made a lot of mistakes at, that were lifestyle choices because I didn't know any better. But then when you do know better, mm -hmm. following the advice that you give is what can get you out of it. But it still requires overcoming that laziness. Every single day we have to overcome it. And we can't cop out just by looking for simple fixes and mm -hmm. expecting it to be easy. Yeah, I, Anthony, I will definitely agree with you that once we have the proper information, yes, that, that I mean, once you have the proper information, you have to put it into action. All the information in the world, I'm going to do a damn thing unless you put it into action. I believe that up until recently, that has been a near impossible. Like if you look at the baby boomer generation, if you look at my mother, the information that she was taught for the first 40 years of her life was so, it was literally, here is the most effective way to become diabetes. Yeah. And she took action on that. She took powerful action on that, right? She did her chronic aerobic exercise. She ate her low fat, high carb foods. She ate less than my father because women aren't supposed to eat a lot of food. She did everything she was told. Mm -hmm. And the reward was diabetes. So now we're learning how not to do that. But then we also have to, we have to have a big, big dose of compassion because for someone who has been told one thing for 50 years, to try to not do that is extremely hard. And that's why that connection, because especially like if your whole peer group is like, what? Eating fat makes you fat. Like everyone knows that. It's really hard to then take action because even though you have the proper information, your social network isn't supporting you. So no, there's layer upon layer. But I, I mean, I love what you said about cognitive laziness. It's good. We're doing like, like a good cop, bad cop thing. I'm like, <laughs> get your shit together. You're like, take it easy, Anthony. It's not, it's not like this. <laughs> and they're, they're both true. So I love it. Um, in terms of, do you have hacks for, a lot of people don't like vegetables. They know they got to eat them. They don't like it. Do you have some hacks for making vegetables and these healthy, non-starchy ones in particular taste good? The number one thing I would say is make smoothies. Okay. Because that just from a convenience perspective, if I had to cook, if I had to cook vegetables every time I ate them, I wouldn't be able to do them. The making green smoothies is absolutely the way to go. Take green leafy vegetables, mix them with some low sugar fruits like strawberries, oranges, put a little protein powder in there if you'd like, mix it up, add a little cinnamon, add a little raw undistilled apple cider vinegar, Great stuff. It's portable. Put them in the refrigerator. Make them all on weekends. Drink them. Easy breezy. Then if you are going to cook, just use healthy fats. I mean, that's, that's, I've not met one person who if you take collard greens or kale and you saute them with coconut oil and salt, people are like, oh, that's disgusting. I mean, that's the irony is, you know, some of the richest food in the world, like the southern food, you know, the collard greens, you know, things which are traditionally disgusting, you know, if they're prepared with the right kinds of fats are quite delicious. And fat and salt aren't bad for you. That's something, again, we've been told for the past 40 years, they're not. So you can use those two things. And if you see vegetables as nothing other than a great fat delivery mechanism, healthy fat delivery mechanism, that could be a great step in the right direction. Do you feel that traditional iodized salt is not bad for you? I feel that it is not why we have a diabetes epidemic. So that's, you know, my, the reason I answer the question that way is if someone says, well, I would eat vegetables if I could salt them, but salt's bad for me. So I'm not going to eat vegetables, which yeah. is the way a lot of people think. I, I just have to be cautious around things like that. So do you still feel that 
you know, like pink Himalayan salt is best, but then next best is table salt. And then after, long after that would be not eating it because yeah. you, you can't salt it. Yeah. I mean, so to be, to be clear, there are certainly higher quality forms of salt than other without question, right? hundred percent. My, my more macro point was, I think a lot of people think that salting food is bad for them. And the research is clear that that is not true. And the research is also clear that if you are not eating vegetables because you think they're gross, and if you salted them, you would be eating them, please salt your vegetables and eat them. <laughs> it's a great point. Yeah. It's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. You know, you're, you're creating a much bigger problem because of something that doesn't really make that big of a difference. In yep. the of things. Um, does, does table salt affect the African-American population more than Caucasians? Is that, is that a wives' tale or a true? No, no. no, no. All right. Just curious. <laughs> um, all right. Nice. Any other products or things that you've found to be, uh, or processes or hacks for making healthy food taste good? I love the, the shake one and, and storing that in the fridge, like use mason jars, things like that. I think overcoming your fear of fat, which I, I'm sure you've talked about a lot. So I'm not going to spend a bunch of time on that. But like you said, I mean, there. When people say that non-starchy vegetables, nutrient-dense protein, whole food fats, and low fructose fruits, which is the general template we practice at my company, Sane, and that we cover in all my books, like, look, there are a million keto recipe books, just like you said. There's a million paleo recipe books. There's a million diabetic-friendly recipe books. It is, if you go to most fine French restaurants, right, it is absolutely the case that, you know, how do you make vegetables taste good. Get a recipe. I mean, the, the, the only way that vegetables taste bad is if you eat them raw. Mm -hmm. I, 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 there's all sorts of ways to make vegetables. I mean, there's, there's more, here, put it this way. There are infinitely more ways to make vegetables taste good than there are to make them taste bad. Because the way they taste bad is basically if you just eat them raw or if you steam them. Yeah. It, it's amazing how much of a difference it makes just using extra virgin olive oil or coconut oil and salt. It tastes way better. It's like, yeah. Yeah, or even uh, just a little thing. Like when I eat, for example, I, I, if I'm going to eat a steak, I found for me that if I take spinach, even just in water that's been wilted down, and I put some spinach on my fork with a piece of steak and I eat them together, that is a, like that's delicious. It's actually, for me, it's tastier than, just eating a piece of steak or just eating spinach, when I eat them together and I get those tastes in combination in my mouth, that's delicious. And that's, you look at Asian cuisine, they do that a lot, right? You're eating protein and vegetables in a sauce together. That combination of flavors, because the meat has that umami flavor, it's also got a fatty flavor, and then you get a bit of bitter from the vegetables. And when those flavors come together on your tongue, it's way more delicious than either of those flavors separately. I like it. I'll have to try that. Um, okay. So we've covered the nutrition. I feel like there's some great stuff on the nutrition side. If, if someone wants to improve blood sugar regulation, overcome diabetes, what is one other category where you would really have them focus their energy and attention? First thing is to eat, or are we not nutrition or nutrition? Other than nutrition. I feel like we've got some, some good stuff for nutrition. And, then, and your books cover a, a lot more and go in much greater detail than we're covering here on this stuff. So they could, they could pick up the set point diet or the calorie myth or um, even the smarter science of slim. Um, but if, if there was another hack that you were going to share while we're hanging out today, what would it be? Sleep. Sleep? More. More. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, I mean, because a, a lot of people, I mean, we – generally at, at my company, we generally work mostly with uh, people who are 40 or older and they've got like, tremendous amount of stress in their lives. They usually have other people they're responsible for. And at the end of the day, sleep is what gets compromised more than anything either. And it gets compromised for noble purposes. It gets compromised to wake up early to exercise. Mm -hmm. For example, you got to sleep, period. I mean, if you, there's been studies that show that if you go one night with four hours of sleep, you will literally wake up with a mild case of diabetes. What I mean by that, I mean that literally. Like if you, if you did a blood test after not sleeping well or enough, your 
your, your measure, your hormonal measures, your blood sugar measures will have noticeably shifted towards diabetes in one night. That's pretty intense. And then uh, this becomes a bit of a paradox because now if we don't keep talking about this a little bit more, some of your viewers and listeners might say, okay, I'm going to try really hard to fall asleep now. I'm gonna, like I got to sleep more. I got to sleep more. And the number one way to have a hard time sleeping is to try really hard to sleep more. <laughs> and it's like, don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. Don't be nervous. Oh my God. The more I try not to be nervous, the more nervous I get. Yes. So, don't think of a big I, pink elephant. <laughs> yes, right. Don't think of that pink elephant. The number one thing I have found to help with sleep is meditation. Mm. Because learning how to, this was the single biggest change in my life over the past three years was getting my brain to shut the heck up changed my life more than any food I've ever eaten more than anything else. It's, it's enabled me to sleep better. It's enabled me to do all sorts of things and meditation, mindfulness, these types of things. Uh, if, if, you know, if you were going to buy 10 diet books next year, buy nine and buy one on meditation. And it doesn't have to be spiritual. It could be spiritual. There's Christian forms of meditation. There's non-secular forms of meditation. There's just mindfulness training. John kabat is a great non, uh, no religious affiliation resource for this. Learning how to meditate. And you want to talk about mental discipline? You want to talk about not b having mental laziness? It's like a superpower, man. Like turning your mind off, just getting your mind to stop. When you experience that, the self-esteem and self-control that it's, it's, it's like seeing life in color for the first time. It's like, whoa, I can, I can do that. I'm not my mind. Whoa, it's amazing. And, it, and then you sleep because you can turn your brain off and you can fall asleep, which is cool. And it's becoming increasingly rare to come across a high performer that is not integrating meditation or a mindfulness practice into their routine now because of some of the benefits you've said. Are you using it or did you start using it at night before bed to kind of wind down? I, the biggest thing for me was I use sensory deprivation. So okay. for two years of my life, I went into a float tank for at least an hour a day, five days a week. And that completely changed my life. So if you have, if you could do that, that's amazing. I know not everyone can do that. Um, but that was really helpful for me. And did that, did that precede meditation? Was meditation before that? What was the order for you? I saw that as being the perfect context in which to meditate. Cause when I tried to meditate in my house, it's like for some people trying to work out in their house. It's like, I need to go to a context in which I'm almost forced to exercise or I can maximally exercise. I found that just like some people, you know, they praying in church is different for them than praying in their bedroom, right? Mm -hmm. Playing soccer on a soccer field versus in your backyard. It just feels more for me going to a place to meditate radically helped me to actually do it because mm. there's no distractions. I mean, when you're in a sensory deprivation tank, there really are no distractions because you can't see, feel, hear, taste, touch, anything. But being in a distraction-free environment where you are physically committed to doing this activity or this lack of activity was really helpful for me. So that's what enabled me. And now it's something where I can like, if I'm on an airplane, I can just do it. I, I can do it in my living room, but it took, two years of dedicated, like this is a big rock in my life to get to that point. It sounds like you were almost rewiring your nervous system from oh, like 100%. sympathetic to parasympathetic. 100%. It literally, I cannot imagine, like I f literally feel like a different person. Like I, I can remember how my brain used to work. I'm like, oh my gosh, like how did I ever sleep? <laughs> it's crazy. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. All right. This is awesome. Um, are you up for some, uh, rapid fire questions? Absolutely. <laughs> All right. Nice. Um, what movie book or podcast episode changed your life? The matrix. Ooh, that's a good one. What's the last book you read and loved? 
and I uh, audiobooks because I, I listen to everything. I'm, I'm all audio as well. Uh, last audiobook I listened to and loved was uh, last one I listened to. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm looking like uh, Audible because <laughs> <laughs> I listen to a lot of them. It's a lot. I'm the same way. My Audible's flooded. Checking. Last audiobook I listened to and loved was because I gave me the name and I want to give the person props because it was very good. Uh, the courage to be disliked. The courage to be disliked. I like that. I like that title. Um, what's your definition of healthy? Being able to manifest the results you want into the world while feeling good about doing so. That's a good one. What's one product you can't live without? I'm trying not to say one of my own products, but <laughs> I, was thinking, I was thinking your pork rinds. I don't I know. know I, I mean, so I, that's literally, I, that's what I was going to say. I was going to yeah. say saying bacon crisps. Cause I, I like at the end of the day, man, I need something crunchy. Like I need to just sit down and crunch on something. And those, those do it for me. So, so saying craving killer bacon crisps at store.sanesolution.com is what I would say. <laughs> these, these, those things are legit, man. I mean, I tried them for the first time at Geary's at, at the mastermind. And then I've got, I've got a, another bag of them here. I cooked, well, the first time I didn't realize you had to cook them, but I guess that's um, a problem that a lot of people have had. So when you get, when you get the, uh, the, the crisps, the pork crisps, make sure you cook them guys. They're not, you're not, they're not meant to be eaten straight out of the bag, but those things are delicious, man. They're like healthy pork rinds. Um, keto friendly, I believe. hundred percent. Yeah. Super keto friendly. Nice. That is a good pick. That was what jumped into my head too. Um, what do you do? Oh, well, you kind of answered that. What you do to unwind and relax? I like the sensory deprivation taken meditation answer. Is there that's actually else? not what I do anymore. What do you What do you do now to unwind and relax? I spend time with my wife and daughter. That's a good one. Um, who inspires you, alive and dead, or dead, or dead? First one that comes to mind is Abraham Lincoln. Mm. What's your favorite supplement? Whey protein. Oh, you got a brand? Mine. <laughs> Sane <laughs> clean whey protein. <laughs> Sane nutrition whey protein. Nice. I like it. And then um, last one. What have you eaten today? Eaten today for breakfast. Because I, I eat when I'm hungry and I stop when I'm full. So I, I will eat many times or few times or just when I'm hungry. For breakfast. I had a sane waffle topped with a sane chocolate sauce and a green smoothie. Then the next thing I ate was like a tuna salad with clams and oysters that I make with avocado Ooh. mayo, which is really good. Some dill, some, some, some curry powder in there. That was really tasty. I had a sane uh, cashew meal bar. I drank a lot of green tea with lemon. And I think that is pretty much what I have. And then a bunch of, like, I, have, I drink green smoothies all throughout the day. That sounds delicious. What, what, like what's in those green smoothies? My green smoothies are a little bit different than what most people would do. But in my green smoothies is Costco sells a green blend that has baby kale, baby shard, and baby spinach in it. Put a bunch of that in there. I put romaine lettuce when it's not, contaminated because that's been recently uh romaine lettuce and then i put a bunch of superfoods so i put what sane garden in my glass which is a greens blend our sane beetroot powder ginger root powder a bunch of raw undistilled apple cider vinegar cinnamon con con jack root uh fiber i put uh lemon and i put I think that's, I, no, that's it. And then I blend the, I use a Vitamix and I blend it a long time, long time, like three minutes so that it's actually nice and smooth. I usually do that in bulk on weekends and then I drink them throughout the day. Whew. 
You're eating good, boy. <laughs> oh, this is awesome. So, Jonathan, we've covered a lot of great stuff. You've also got the, the Set Point Diet, um, your newest book, and the Calorie Myth Diet. Give us like a quick, yeah, give us, give us, give us a quick um, elevator um, rendition of what the Set Point Diet's all about. The Set Point Diet is extremely exciting because in my first two books, The Smarter Science of Some of the Calorie Myth, really spent, I, I, I laid out 10, 15 years worth of research on what's wrong and what the problems are. And the number one piece of feedback we got from that was, cool, everything I thought was true is false. What do I do now? Mm-hmm. <laughs> You're right. So what we then did is, you know, I, at that time I was working at Microsoft. We were able to get funded. We started a wellness technology company to start to figure out solutions to these problems. And over the past couple of years, we've collected a tremendous amount of data actually putting these solutions into practice with people. And the Set Point Diet book is extremely exciting because it contains a 21-day most potent and therapeutic protocol to lower your set point. So to reverse that neurological inflama- um, inflammation, to rebalance your hormones and to heal your gut in the most therapeutic, like concentrated form possible that we've tested and tested and tested on tens of thousands of people over years to give you the fastest results. And then of course there's a maintenance plan as well. And it's everything, Anthony, it's not just eating. It's eating, it's movement, it's sleeping, it's how you talk to yourself, it's how you relate to other people. It's literally every aspect that we've talked about today and and we 90-10 it, man. We give you the 10% that's gonna give you 90% of the results and we're gonna give you some really advanced tactics like certain amino acids like leucine and glutamine and certain nutraceuticals that you can use during that 21 day period to treat this like, hey man, if you want to lower your set point and reverse diabetes, like it, your life matters, or like your life depends on it, because it does, there, there will never be a more effective protocol than this to do that. I dig it. What do you, what do you have coming up that you're excited about? So in addition to the launch of the book, which is cool, that's December 24th of 2018, in uh, late January, early February of 2019, we are world premiering the mini series Diabesity. It's just called Diabesity, and it, we filmed it on location at the Harvard Medical School. It's an eight-part series that we did in conjunction with a, a wonderful movie studio, the same people that helped to create uh, a bunch of things that you've seen on Netflix that we can't talk about publicly anymore because I got in trouble for that, but <laughs> the, um, it's, it's incredible, right? We got some of the, the greatest minds in the world from the Harvard Medical School, as well as over 18 real-life success stories. Uh, and we just explore over eight different episodes, the cause of diabetes, the different solutions to it, and how these 18 courageous people have applied those solutions to their lives to see literally life-saving results. And again, mind, body, spirit, everything. It's not just nutrition. It's all of those things. And it's extremely powerful. What type of results were these people in the diabetes miniseries getting? If you could give us a little bit of a sneak peek. Sure. Well, I'll give you two stories. I'll give you a male story and a female story. So male story, St- Sam Sterling. Sam Sterling is an ex-NFL player, ex-Vietnam uh, veteran who was actually a POW in Vietnam. He's in his mid-60s. Here's the short version of the story. Sam has lost 173 pounds in just over a year. And his fingernails, which were pulled out while he was a POW, after 40 years, have finally grown back. Did you say 173 pounds in how long? Little over a year. Oh, by the way, he was diabetic. He is no longer on any form of medication. His blood levels indicate no diabetes. He even went to the eye doctor, and you can detect uh, diabetic issues in your eyes. Retina scan came back totally clear, no trace of diabetes. Holy shit. That's amazing. Yeah, it's pretty, it's very amazing. And then, uh, You're another not story. Top that one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I know. Well, that, that's, you know, that's a male. So Christine Biswabic, amazing individual. So she suffered from polycystic ovarian syndrome. She was carrying about 150 excess pounds of fat on her body. 
uh, when she was hit head on by a truck and broke her neck. She has since then lost over 100 pounds, kept it off for uh, many years, uh, reversed those medical conditions, and is actually now a martial arts instructor who's just rocking life. I mean, it's just amazing. This is great. I mean, it's proof, it's proof it works and it's replicable and predictable. Super pumped about the work you're doing, brother, and the way that you're changing the world and great hanging out with you as always. Not quite as fun as when we're in person together, but nonetheless, given our geographical limitations, it was the best we could do right now. And um, for the people that are listening and want to stay up to date with the cool projects you've got coming up, What's the best way for, for them to do that? Well, please go to Sane Solution, S-A-N-E, Solution, singular, SaneSolution.com. There's any number of places you can sign up to get freebies, and then we'll keep you up to date 100% via email on the new book, the new mini series, all that fun stuff. So just SaneSolution.com, opt in for one of the free goodies, and we will absolutely take care of you. My man, appreciate you hanging out. It's been a pleasure having you on the Biohacking Secrets show and I'm looking forward to hanging out in person again soon.